in worship this week. We are so glad that you are worshiping with us from wherever you might be. If you are at home, if you are traveling, if you're on vacation, we are just glad that you are worshiping with us this weekend. We've had a wonderful weekend here at Mountain View. Our men's retreat wrapped up on Saturday night. It was a staycation of sorts. Instead of going away as normal, we stayed here at home and had a wonderful time of worship and learning. If you are new to Mountain View or if you've been around for a while and you'd like to find more information, submit a prayer request, go to mtnvw.org slash hub and you'll find an online connection card. You can sign up for a small group. It's not too late. You can submit a prayer request and you can give online. And speaking of online, I have one of my newest friends here with me, Mike Roncalia. Mike is our newest staff addition. One of the things that COVID has taught us in terms of ministry is the need to always be forward thinking with our digital ministry. And so Mike is our new online campus pastor. And we are so excited to have Mike with us. Mike's a local. He's actually an authentic native of Colorado. He is a graduate of Colorado School of Mines, worked in tech for a while, and then led a discipleship ministry for eight years. And then just recently, he and his wife felt called to go back to school, and they're at Denver Seminary. So I hope you'll have a chance to meet Mike online or in person. We're just excited to have him. We have a great time of worship tonight, and then I'm going to come and continue our series on Philippians and close our service with a time of communion. So let's all worship together. Our Mount View, you all ready to celebrate with us? It's so good to see you all. My name is Jay. I'm the worship pastor here at Mount View. Welcome to our family. If you're new, we're excited you're here. We're going to begin by singing some songs about Jesus. Amen. King of glory. Let's not lose heart in this time, church, but let's lift him up in praise and worship. Oh, don't lose heart, oh my soul, oh my soul. No, don't give up. There is hope, there is always hope. Yes, there is. words together, church. Sing it out with us. Come on. There is a king of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up a shout of praise. There is a lion roaring. Jesus, the king of glory. So lift your Let's set our eyes, set our eyes. There is a king of glory. There is a God who saves. One who is strong and mighty. Freedom is in his name. Open the gates of heaven. Lift up a shout of praise. And there is a lion roaring. Jesus, the king of glory. Yes, he is. Nation bow, mountain shake. Nations bow, mountain shake. At the sound of just one name, over all Jesus reigns. I know. Yes, I know. Let's sing that again. Declare it out. Nations bow, mountain shake. At the sound of just one name, and over all Jesus reigns, I know, yes, I know. There is power in that one name, amen, church? If you're able, let's worship with our whole bodies, yes, not just our voice, just like this, huh? If you're feeling it at home, wherever you're at, church, come on. He is worthy. He's the King of Glory. 
song of redemption church sing it out if it's your story because i searched the world but it couldn't fill me and man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough then you came along Put me back together And every desire Is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, yeah. oh there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you Oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Oh God, you know it's true, yeah. And I'm not afraid, no, to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. The God of the mountain He's the God of the valley And there's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again
beautiful praise. Centering our hearts on Jesus and his goodness. Let's sing of his love and mercy. Your mercy never fails me in all my days. I've been held in your hand from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. Oh, I will see of the goodness of God. the goodness of God. Father God, we 
we just rest in your goodness. We rest knowing that you will be there and that you are good. And when we come to you, it will be good because you have only good for us. I pray for blessing over this offering that we lift up to you. Thank you for the goodness that you have poured out onto us so that we can give it back to you. I pray for blessing over our gift back to you that it be used in the way that brings glory to you because that is our hope for you is to bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. We are in our series on Philippians that we have entitled Philippians. And this week, what we're talking about is the reality that at some point in life, every one of us will face a difficulty. It might be a small challenge. It may be a major hurdle. It might be a train wreck. It could be an illness. It could be the loss of a job. It might be unemployment. It could be the breakup of a family. But at some point in our life, each of us will face a difficult time, which raises the question, how do you rise above difficult circumstances? When you encounter that challenge, when you encounter that difficulty, how do you rise above difficult circumstances? This might surprise you, but people who study and research resilient people, who study resiliency, they actually agree with Jesus. Now, they won't use the same language, they don't talk the same way, tell the same stories, but they all point to the same thing. And the idea is this, that the way you rise above difficult circumstances is you live for something that's larger than your circumstances. That if you're living for something that's the same size or smaller than your circumstances, you will never rise above your challenges. What we're going to look at in our passage of Scripture this, this weekend is the idea that where, what is that something? If we are to live for something that is larger than our circumstances, where do you find that something? Honestly, some people look for that something in their job, and they believe that their job, their success, their career path, that that something is going to allow them to rise above their circumstances. Some people bounce from one relationship to the next, thinking that the next relationship the right relationship, is going to allow them to rise above their circumstances. Some of you might know someone like this. We have a lot of these folks in, Col in, in Colorado. Maybe it's being a weekend warrior. You know, that's how you find your something. Y you go tackle something. You go climb something. You go ride something. But what we're going to find in our passage is the problem with those things is they're not big enough to solve our problem. In fact, sometimes they actually contribute to our problem. The premise that we're going to look at in Philippians chapter 1 is the idea that there's only one thing that allows us to overcome adversity. Philippians is written by the Apostle Paul, as you might have heard last weekend if you joined us online or in person as we kicked off the series. The book of Philippians is written to the church in Philippi. It's written by the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul starts the church in Philippi, and when he writes this particular letter, he's writing from prison. He's writing from jail. He's literally under house arrest, and he has been for a period of time, maybe up to two years altogether. And yet, when you read the book of Philippians, and particularly this passage, you have to ask yourself the question, how does Paul reframe adversity? 
Because he obviously does. And here's the main thing that we're going to talk about through the rest of our teaching time. And the main thing is simply this, the gospel. Understanding the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus reframes how we view adversity. That when you understand who Jesus is, but more importantly, what he did, it helps us to reframe, kind of, kind of re- have a new perspective on how we view adversity. So we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12 this week. So if you have your Bible or if you want to click open a tab or open up your phone or however you find your way to a Bible, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. The words of Paul. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's talking about his prison experience. That what's happened to him, getting arrested, being put in jail, has actually served to advance the gospel. Notice verse 13. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Paul says, the way I see my circumstances, the the way I see being in prison is actually a positive thing, that it has served to advance the cause of the gospel. When Paul talks about being in chains, he's not talking about figurative chains. He's talking about literal chains. And at any given time, Paul, as he's under house arrest, is literally chained to a Roman soldier. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, probably for the entire two years that he's in jail. He's literally chained to a Roman soldier. One would serve his shift, do his eight hours. The next soldier would come in. He would be chained to Paul. And that was Paul's existence, being chained to these Roman soldiers. It's estimated by historians that during the time of Paul that there were almost 10,000 Roman palace guards. So when Paul talks about in these verses that it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and that everyone that what has happened has happened to advance the gospel, he might be talking about almost 10,000 guards. And at any given time, he's chained to one of them. And if it were you or if it were me, we might look at this situation and think, wouldn't it be better to be free? If Paul could be a free man, if Paul could travel, do do whatever he wanted to, whenever he wanted to, go wherever he wanted to, wouldn't that be better for the gospel? And yet Paul doesn't see this as a hindrance. In fact, quite the opposite. Paul sees it as an opportunity. In Paul's mind, I've got their undivided attention. There's nowhere they can go. They're they're chained to me at every every moment. They're going to hear everything that I say, and they're going to hear everything that I pray, every conversation. This chained Roman soldier is going to have to listen. And as Paul cycles through the different shifts and all the different soldiers and all the different guards, and, and then as they talk to others, Paul says this has really not been a hindrance. In fact, it's been a blessing. When you think about Paul's circumstances, Paul was a captive. Paul was not a free man. Paul was not able to go wherever he wanted to. Paul was a captive. And yet, how did Paul see things? Paul saw his captive audience. Paul thinks, I'm not the captive here. You're the one that's going to have to listen. You're the one that's going to have to pay attention. And Paul ends up sharing Jesus with the people that he's chained to. It's a point that that message spreads throughout the whole palace guard. And over those two years, Paul influences upwards of thousands of soldiers who hear about Jesus. We don't know what they decide. We don't know what they believe, but they certainly heard about Jesus. And how did Paul do that? One soldier at a time. Chained to one soldier and then the next soldier and you might be thinking, if you're a person, a person of faith, and you're in high school, you're in college, or, or you go to work, or you're involved in your community, and you're thinking, how do we influence a school? 
How do we influence our community? How, how do I bring change to my workplace? The same way Paul did. One person at a time. Paul sees his chains not as a hindrance, but as an opportunity. And how is Paul able to do this? He allows the Holy Spirit to transform his attitude towards his circumstances. The natural Paul is much like the natural Ken, much like the natural you. Does want to be in jail? Doesn't want to be locked up? You know, doesn't want to be in prison? He would rather be free. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit in Paul's life that begins to transform how he sees his circumstances. Let me ask you a question. What adversity might you be facing in your life right now? What difficult moment, what difficult season? And how might the Holy Spirit be able to transform that season, that moment, that challenge, that difficulty from a hindrance to an opportunity. It's to wonder the power of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is able to take our circumstances, and He doesn't always change our circumstances, but He changes our attitude about our circumstances. And so Paul is, is facing adversity. He's in prison, but it's not the only adversity that he's facing. In fact, while Paul's in prison, there, there's something that's happening back in Philippi. There must have been messengers going back and forth from, from Philippi to Rome and, and kind of giving Paul an update on what's going on back in hometown, back in Philippi. And, and there are adversaries back in Philippi. There are people who are competing with Paul. In fact, notice what Paul says in verse 15. Paul says, it is true. That some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter, they do so out of love, knowing that I am here for the defense of the gospel. The former, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing, the important thing, is that Christ is preached, whether from false motives or true, and because of this, I rejoice. I have to be honest. The younger Pastor Ken would not have been as generous as the Apostle Paul. I would not have been as, as charitable, as forgiving as Paul is in this passage. Paul's not talking about, and let's make sure we understand what he's talking about and what he's not talking about. He's not talking about false teachers. When Paul writes about false teachers in other passages, he doesn't hold back. He goes straight, you know, he deals harshly with them. In this case, it's not false teachers. In fact, they're preaching Christ. They're preaching out of false motives. What he calls selfish ambition, uh, you know, envy, rivalry. And, and it seems like their main motive is really to stir up trouble for Paul. If Paul weren't in prison, then think of all the good that Paul could be doing. If, if Paul hadn't got in trouble, then Paul could be here in Philippi. He could be traveling, doing his missionary journeys, and they're trying to stir up trouble for Paul. And yet Paul asks an amazing question. But what does it matter? As I think about my own journey as a follower of Jesus, particularly as a, a pastor, as a preacher, are there people who, who, who preach differently than me? People you might see on television or from different traditions or different backgrounds? Yes. Are, are there people who say things that, that I may not agree with on every, every issue, every idea, every opinion? Yes. Do they sometimes say things that make me cringe? Yes. But what does it matter? If they're preaching Christ and Christ crucified, Paul says the main thing is Christ is preached and I will rejoice. Paul looks at his adversaries and he's able to see the good that they're doing. 
That's pretty remarkable. He's able to see that, that at least Jesus is being preached to people who otherwise might not hear Jesus. And Paul says, if they're preaching Christ crucified, I will rejoice. How do you explain this? How do you explain Paul's attitude? You know, Paul's way of looking not just at his present sale and the chains, but these, these teachers who are preaching out a false motive. How do you explain Paul's attitude? Makes you wonder. Did, did, did Paul get an advanced copy, you know, some, oh, let's say 1950 years early, uh, of, of Norman Vincent Peale's The Power of Positive Thinking? You know, did, did Paul get an advanced copy? You know, oh, this is the key. You know, I just need to be a positive thinker. And, and if I'll just think positively, then all my circumstances will magically change. That's not how Paul reframes his attitude. In fact, notice the next part of verse 18. Paul says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Christ, that what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always... Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. And here, verse 21, for to me, in my mind, Paul says, the way I see things, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. There you have it. Paul talks about having sufficient courage. Sufficient courage to face his circumstances, to deal with his imprisonment, to deal with these adversaries in Philippi. And when Paul talks about courage, true courage is not just physical power. It's not just being physically up to the task. True courage is not the absence of fear. True courage is a spiritual strength that we get from Jesus. And Paul says, I hope to have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my life or in my death. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If you were to paraphrase the attitude of Paul, Paul says, while I'm alive, I'm living for Jesus. I'm going to orient my life, my priorities around Christ. If I die, all the better. All the better. But because I get to be with Jesus forever. Paul says this is really the secret. Is understanding what Jesus has done. Notice verse 22. If I am to go on, if I am to go on living in the body, in other words, stay alive, not go to be with Jesus, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Paul's kind of unzipping here a little bit, and he's opening up, and he's saying, let me, let me describe to you the tension that I feel. The tension that I feel is I've lived my life to this point, believing in Jesus, called by Jesus, wanting to be with Jesus, and that's the best by far. But if I know if God allows me to stay alive and God permits me to keep on living, that that means good things will happen. Fruitful labor. Paul's not talking about success in the way we understand it. When Paul talks about fruitful labor, What he's talking about is influencing people for Jesus. About bringing the lost to be found. Helping those in darkness to come to light. And Paul says, if I stay alive, I know that there's going to be good that comes from that. But he says, to be honest with you, I'm torn. There's this civil war. You know, there's this tension. I'm torn between the two. I really want to depart and be with Christ. But I believe I should stay And remain in the body. Notice verse 25. 
convinced of this. I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. Paul says, I've got this battle. I believe it's better to be with Jesus, but if I stay alive, there's going to be fruitful labor, and I'm living for Christ, but I know to die is gain. So how do you rise above difficult circumstances? How did Paul do it? It's pretty clear. Paul had a a clear sense that he was living for something that was larger than his circumstances. And that was Jesus. He was living for Christ. He wasn't just living for a cause. You know, kind of like we have a cause. You know, it may be whatever your cause might be, if it's recycling or if it's, if it's the environment or if it's even social justice or poverty or refugees or immigrants. Paul's not just living for a cause. He's living for Christ. And Paul says, I can live, you know, I, I can handle these circumstances, these adverse, you know, adverse times, because I'm living for Jesus. When you think about the cross, when you think about the gospel, and, and what God does through Jesus Christ when, when Jesus does his work on the cross, what was that for? What was the intended outcome? You know, how how God hoped to use that in your life? The work of the cross was never intended to just shape your church life. Meaning the things that, that you do in and around church or for church or at church or at the church building or in a small group. The work of Jesus on the cross was never intended just to shape the church part of you. It was intended to shape every part of you. That's why Paul could say, for me to live is Christ. It's not about Christ. It is Christ. Because in Paul's mind, the cross had changed everything about his life. In fact, notice verse 27. Paul says, whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ. Whatever happens. That covers a lot of ground. When Paul says whatever happens, he's talking about what happens at home, what happens at school, what happens at work. Paul says whatever happens, whatever life throws at you, if you're in a good season with with kind of a smooth road, if you're in a rough patch, you're in a hole. Paul says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens at home, honor Jesus. Whatever happens at school, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel. Whatever happens with the election in November, conduct yourself in a manner Worthy of the gospel. Paul says it's all about the gospel. And we can't look at adversity as our excuse. As our our reason to not honor Jesus. As our our reason to not conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel. Paul says whatever happens. Conduct yourself in a manner that's worthy of the gospel of Christ then whether I come and I see you or I only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. And since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. 
those are words that don't really fit with modern ears so much. They're not going to be found on a, on a bumper sticker. You're not going to find too many self-help books. You know, if you go on to Amazon, type in, you know, the benefit of suffering, you know, the, you know, the call of suffering. But Paul says, it's been granted to you. That's, a, that's an act of graciousness. It's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. How did Paul see adversity? Not as something that God was doing to him. He saw adversity as something that God had granted him to experience. Paul saw adversity different. Because he looked at life and his circumstances through the lens of the cross. Through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. How do you rise above those difficult circumstances? You must have something larger than your circumstances that you're living for. We often use language here at at Mountain View. We don't want things from you, but we want things for you. So as your pastor, what do I want for you? As we kind of look at this passage and how Paul looked at adversity and how he handled his circumstances, what do I want for you? I would want for you to choose the right perspective. You have two options. One is to choose what comes natural, our human perspective. And simply look at life as a series of circumstances and situations and process them through your limited understanding. And when life is good, your attitude is good. And when life is hard, it's not. Or to have an eternal perspective. One that's rooted in the gospel. That's built on the foundation of what Jesus did when he died for you. But more important, when he came back to life. And to have an eternal perspective, that's what I want for you. So as we close our teaching time, I want to do so with a word of prayer. Because I don't know what your difficult season might be. If it's an illness, if it's economics, if it's finances, if it's a relationship, or if it's just 2020. We're in a difficult stretch. And so I want to pray. I want to pray for those of you who follow Jesus, who have given your life to him, that you begin to see and understand your life through the lens of the cross. That you could say, as Paul would say, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And for those of you who might be facing difficult times and circumstances, and you're doing so without a relationship with Jesus. I want to pray for you too. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for how much you love us and to the extent that you would go in giving Jesus to live and to die for us. Paul, we look at, we look at the life of Paul and, and we see everything that he went through and just not just this one passage, but God, we know he was shipwrecked and he was beaten and he was bit by a snake. There was so much that Paul endured. And yet he held on to the cross and to the power and the hope of the resurrection. So God, I want to pray for each and every person who's worshiping with us, whatever they're facing, that God, they will have sufficient courage that's not based on their own ability or their own intellect or strength, but it's based on the promise of the gospel. And Father, I want to pray for those tonight, tomorrow, whatever time, who are facing this life and they're doing so entirely in their own strength, without a relationship with Jesus. That, Father, there might be something about this message, something about these words of Paul that will start a journey, that will will create a conversation. Father, that they will know that they do not have to carry these burdens themselves. That you created them and you love them and you want to be in relationship with them. And that, Father, all we have to do is turn to you in faith and repentance 
to say yes to you and to surrender our will to yours. And Father, we, we believe at that moment that not just our sins are forgiven, but our future is secured. So Father, for those who need to make that decision, may this be that moment. And we pray this in the name, the powerful name of Jesus who makes it possible. Amen. We're going to share communion together, which we do each week here at Mountain View. So if you have your communion elements ready, this is the time. How did Jesus face adversity? One of the best snapshots that we have in the life of Christ is the night that he's betrayed. And he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he knows what's about to come. He knows how a person is crucified and, and what that's like. And he prays to God three times. God, that there's a different way, a different path, a, a different mechanism, then please take this cup from me. But each time he circles around. And he says to God, but not my will, but yours be done. Ultimately, as people of faith, that's how we handle adversity. We pray, we hope, we desire, and then we yield. We surrender. And we're so thankful that Jesus did. Because if Jesus had shown, chose the natural path that night in Gethsemane, he never would have ended up on the cross. And yet because he made that decision, we can celebrate communion, but we don't celebrate elements or symbols. We celebrate a reality. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this time of communion. We thank you for Jesus, that you, Christ, did not, did not turn away from adversity. But for the joy that was set before you, you endured the cross. You scorned it shame. And you sit today at the right hand of God. So we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.
as we sing this last song together, church, we're reminded that we sing up, not out. This is a song of plea. It's a song of reminder that God continues to make a way. Even through whatever storm we're going through. Let's lift it to him. You are here. You're moving in our midst. I worship you. Yes, I worship you. You are here. You're working in this place. I worship you. Yes, I worship you. Because you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Let's declare it. Yes, you are. Way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are here. You're touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Only you, God. You are here. You're healing every heart. I worship Make a way in our lives this moment. If there's something we're struggling with now, we lift it all to you, Father. Because you make a way. Even in the moment when we don't see it in the storm, you're walking with us. And that's why we sing. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. He never stops, he never stops. Declare it, church. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. He never stops. He never stops. Move his spirit. Yeah, yeah. You're working. You never stop. You never stop. No, you never stop. You never stop. We make a miracle work.
let him make a way. Cause that is who you are. Just sing it to him. That is who you are. Yes, that is who you are. That is who you are, Father. That is who you are. That is who you are. Yes, that is who you are. That is who you are. Amen, church. I love declaring those words with you. Friends, we're so glad you joined us this week. We pray that you have a blessed week. We're super excited. Next week, we're going to continue this this sermon series on Philippians, talking about Jesus and how great of an example he gives each one of us in our lives and how we can emulate that in our own lives. Friends, take care, and we'll see you next week. God bless.